Thank you. So um, this roundtable is being convened to discuss sort of where we stand in terms of ESG within the ILS and cap bond market. And um, as I said, we're interested to hear what are the needs of the market and whether there is resistance or reluctance among market participants to comply with ESG and what might drive such behaviour as well. Um, joining us on this, we have Paul Schultz, CEO of Aon Securities, Corey Anger, Managing Director at GC Securities, Patrick Roder, Associate Partner at Synpulse Management Consulting, Roland Kolsch, Managing Director of QNG, who provide the sustainability seal FNG, Andy Palmer, the Head of ILS Structuring, EMEA and APAC at Swiss Re Capital Markets Limited, Tommy Piemont, Head of Sustainability Research at Bank for Kirsch and Caritas and also of Shareholders for Change. Dirk Schmelzer, ILS Fund Manager and Partner of, and Head of the ESG Competence Centre at Plenum Investments and Nico Richman, Partner and from the ESG Competence Centre at Plenum Investments as well. So to kick off, I'm going to turn to Roland and ask you, could you describe the status quo around the implementation of the ESG framework in the EU and where we stand in terms of implementation of the law? Yeah, thanks, Steve. And uh, as you pointed out, regulation coming in and sustainable investments, trying to give a um, framework for 20 years of market participants creating, let's say, their own SOI standards or SOI world with different investment styles, reporting and disclosures. They did on a voluntary basis. Now, there were different um, elements of regulation coming in. Altogether, the European Union has put up 10, let's say, 10 uh, working fields. Um, but I think we should focus on three main topics at the moment that is of interest for the investment community. Um, and these are not harmonized. That's why I have to point out to three pillars, which makes it difficult, I think, in the discussion afterwards, um, what we have to um, deal with. Um, of course, the, the, the core, the, the heart of it is the so-called taxonomy. Um, an essay of the European Union, Union of the European Union to define um, environmental sustainable economic activities, which is important to know. It's a green part of the economy. It's not about companies. It's about activities, economic activities. Um, normally, they have six objectives from climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, these two already have been um, published and they um, have to be executed within 2021. You have four other objectives um, like circular economy, ocean maritime systems um, that will be finished during the next two years, they will have to be executed in uh, 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 operationalized in 2022. Um, so that the whole, let's say, green taxonomy will have put in place. Um, the task now is to link companies, of course, with these activities to then define, for example, what should be in a kind of sustainable fund or to calculate the greenness factor. Um, then for all the asset managers from a certain, let's say, um, revenue and employee point of um, um, level, they have to disclose what they do in terms of ESG. And um, there is regulation saying when you do, let's say, an ESG advertisement or when you use an ESG framing, then you have disclosed some things. I will tell you later what it could be. Um, and when you go one step farther, when you really claim to achieve a sustainable objective, um, then you have disclosed other things. These are resumed in Article 8 and 9. Um, furthermore, you have to deal with a kind of ESG risk management disclosure. Almost any asset manager has to show how to deal with sustainability challenges within its risk management. Um, and based on the Disclosure Delegated Act, these are delegated acts, these are new, not new um, paragraphs that have to be decided in a normal way, but these are paragraphs that link to already existing rules, so it's called Delegated Acts. Um, based on this, it's the, the target market concept of the MIFI 2 it's the regulation uh, where all the 
EU asset managers and the distributors have to comply with um, when they sell products to different clients. And here is a huge debate at the moment, what will still be allowed to being sold to customers um, when it comes to some reportings where so far people thought when you um, link your products to these two articles, um, it's eight and nine within the disclosure regulation, then you automatically uh, uh, will be compliant with the target market. But since one month, people discuss about perhaps not fulfilling the suitability test when a client really expresses verbis wants a sustainable product that not all the Article 8 product um, will fulfill these requirements. What you can hear, I, I, um, I, I'm not very precise in what I say, because even the German, all the supervisory bodies, we talked to the French and the German supervisory body, they're waiting for a consultation process that uh, went on and is now being finalized to be published to the parliament, which will take place in mid end of January for so-called technical standards um, that will define some people say 15 to 16 indicators that then will have to be published. So this is a unfortunately complex world, but you have to differentiate this taxonomy regulation with the green activities you have a disclosure regulation, what you have to report on, and you have the target market, the products you will, you, you will be able to sell. All these three have different languages and they are not 100% aligned and harmonized. That's why we have a kind of bordel, like say the French, uh, a chaotic way, why I think we are sitting together to discuss a bit more. Okay, thank you, Roland. That's very helpful. So there's, there's a lot of um, regulation coming in in 2021, which could impact investors in the EU, European Union and how they allocate to asset classes, including to ILS. So um, turning to Paul um, from Aon Securities, do you have a feeling for how much European investor money is in the ILS market at this stage? Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we publish uh, an annual report every year and we sort of detail that and that's certainly available for anyone who wants to, to take a look at that. But when we look at really the prior 12 months, uh, just under 40% of the capacity deployed into cap bonds came from European ILS funds. And uh, we break that out geographically. So 8% from the UK, 7% from France, 2% from Germany, 2% from Sweden, and 20% from Switzerland. So, so, so very significant. Yes, no, that, that is significant. Thank you, Paul. Um, and then turning to Corey, um, do you do you have a feeling for is is ESG being sufficiently considered in the ILS market at this time? Obviously, it's a very hot topic at the moment. But um, do you think it's it's just uh, being considered and not actually implemented at this stage? Or how how mature do you think the industry is? So I think there's a strong commitment from ILS managers in looking at ESG strategies. Um, but I would say for how you implement it into risk transfer and in the insurance space, we're probably in the infancy of how fund managers can address and respond to the principles of responsible investments. Um, because to be clear, there is no kind of compliance standard. There's no defined rules for what makes ESG in any category, though I think in certain sectors, they've started to... Um, uh, define how, how what they consider to meet ESG uh, uh, um, goals. And so I think that, um, you know, while they're in their infancy, I think there's a lot of room. Um, we see a lot of the top ILS managers you know, focused on this. And to be clear, while, you know, about 40% of the fund managers come from, from Europe, you know, a lot of the capital that's coming in is that they're managing is coming globally. So it's coming with a lot of different voices and a lot of different um, uh, opinions around this. And, um, you know, we do have a view that, you know, that investors have a belief that uh, incorporating ESG leads to better decision making. And the hope is that it would lead to better predictive uh, analysis. And so I think really what we're talking about is a strategic opportunity for differentiation. But how you implement it to the space may be very different than how you implement it from traditional financing. I think the divestment approach of, of what ESG has done in traditional financings, which means 
I'm not going to invest in certain sectors may not necessarily apply to the insurance and the reinsurance space and causing a change with respect to um, mitigating climate impact and insured losses. Great, thank you, Corey. Um, so moving on to Patrick, um, we've recently conducted an ESG survey looking at um, how different players in the risk transfer market have incorporated ESG into their strategies and operations. Uh, what were the sort of headline outcome of that? How much time do I have? <laughs> It's quite quite some findings, but let me let me begin by, by giving you some some background about the the motivation of the study. Then one main finding, and then uh, maybe a bit of a deep dive in three of the, the findings which I find the most interesting. So we have been involved with uh, ESG projects for quite a while on the banking side, but less so on the on the ILS side. Uh, but uh, as you all know, during the last one or two years, the discussions around the inherent ESG qualities of of uh, ILS as an asset class have intensified. So we wanted to dig a bit deeper. Why? Because first of all, you know, it's true it has inherent ESG qualities, but this is a necessary but not a sufficient condition in my view. Some of our clients confirmed that, but we didn't have a holistic view on this. So that's kind of when we teamed up with you, Steve, and wanted to get uh, an overall view. So if I had to summarize the finding in, in one sentence, it, it would be that the market agrees. ESG is important today and even more so in the future. But the actions taken, they do not met yet match the, the aspirations that have been voiced. So three, three main findings. So the, the first one, 80% uh, of our uh, respondents uh, agreed that ESG is today a major consideration for their firm. And 95% of the respondents said it's going to be even more important in the future. Uh, the next question is, of course, why do they care? So the, the fund managers, I mean, we surveyed insurance companies, reinsurance companies, uh, ILS fund managers that were dedicated to ILS, but also um, that also did ILS amongst other asset classes as well as institutional investors. But the fund manager said it's first of all, investor desire, second, risk management, and third, reputation. Now, what I find interesting, uh, at least in the class of non-dedicated ILS fund managers, the Second most important reason was uh, that was mentioned was positive alpha, which I find interesting because there's no real conclusive, uh, I mean, evidence that this is actually true. Also very interesting is that regulation was not near the top to, anywhere near the top to be found. It was actually the third least important, which, you know, we heard Roland speaking about the EU regulation coming in, but even for EU players, this is not important at the moment. So second finding, um, we asked the question, which elements or which part is in the, the risk transfer value chain are you analyzing during the underwriting and investment process? And here, um, the answer was uh, sponsors or sedents. That's uh, definitely being analyzed. Covered risks, so the underlying portfolio, um, as well as the um, uh, as well as the collateral. Right. Um, also surprising, I guess. But then there was a big gap until the next categories come. And I think here the fine or the, the, the lesson we can take is this is not the whole risk value chain. There are other players involved, service providers that, you know, maybe also one should look at. The, the last finding is that 90% uh, of the um, surveyed fund managers said that, you know, for them, it's important that they have an ESG friendly investment offering a product, an ESG friendly fund but only 35% of the respondents actually do offer an ESG friendly fund. Now, on the one hand, uh, I would have thought that this number is actually lower because if you look out there, how many funds are actually actively marketing ESG friendly funds? It's not so many, right? But then on the other hand, one also has to ask the question, why is it not higher, right? If it's perceived as being so important. Now, I can only speculate, but one reason might be that it's not so cheap you know, to do that. You have to do a lot of analysis and someone has to pay for it. And maybe it's not the best market condition to charge higher fund management fee at the moment. Another explanation is based on another finding from the study that most fund managers uh, do not really have a ESG strategy implemented. They might have one, but it's not reflected in the operating model. And I would argue you cannot offer an ESG friendly fund if you don't have an implemented strategy. So that's really a very high level and brief summary of the, of the findings. Uh, the study will be published next week on December 16th. So very happy to share with uh, all of you if you're, if you're interested. Great, thank you, Patrick. Um, that's very useful context on how the industry sort of perceives itself at this time. 
Um, so moving on, I'm going to turn to Andy Palmer from Swiss Re. And obviously Swiss Re has been very vocal in its own ESG work. But um, do you see any resistance or reluctance within the marketplace as a whole to comply with ESG? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Stephen. As, as you say, um, Swiss Re has been pretty pretty vocal um, on, on this itself with, with its approach. Um, I think from, from our perspective, we would actually say the opposite. Um, there is there is very active interest in the topic. I think we heard um, other participants allude to just that fact. Um, you know, Patrick just outlined that in terms of the, the survey. Corey alluded to it as well. There is this very active interest in the topic. Um, you can see that Swiss Re, for example, um, takes it very importantly for its own um, for its own um, perspective. But I think when you when you look at our counterparts, competitors, clients, um, we have many, many discussions on this topic and they increase um, across the board. And, and, and that awareness and that discussion um, perspective is actually very, very important, right? To make sure it does indeed go right the way through the, the, the value chain. Um, I think that the tricky part that we've seen is it, it isn't obviously so um, so black and white as to say something is necessarily ESG friendly or compliant and something isn't. It, it's not as easy to implement as that. And, you know, that can be represented if we look at um, the approach that Swiss Re at least has taken to sustainability. It's more of a gradual process anyway over time. Um, and driving itself and also the market, you know, to the extent possible sort of uh, towards um, a more ESG sort of friendly space. So that I think is, is, is the challenge here is, is one also of timing. So when we think about the regulations coming in quite soon, um, it's actually just how long can, can people have to, you know, mature the market. It, you know, Corey used a good phrase, it's in its infancy, is how long can it take to mature um, to get to, to where we want it to be. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, and turning to Paul briefly, um, it'd be interesting to hear from you sort of how how you are, you're approaching ESG with your clients, perhaps on the ILS side and maybe on maybe more on the structuring side. It'd be interesting to hear. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And I think, you know, there are certainly some activities that we have just on, done over time that I think fall squarely into the kind of ESG compliant, uh, you know, type of investing and and the one we'd probably highlight is just uh, what the World Bank has done and, and, and certainly the IBRD collateral. And when you look at uh, the, the aggregate of IBRD collateral over, over the period of time, it's been something like $13 billion across 60 different bonds. Um, and as we speak to investors, and again, we have some surveys that we've done that are all sort of available in the annual report. Uh, the ES, you know, the, the IBRD collateral is a way to sort of talk about the uh, ESG compliance, given the, the sustainable nature of kind of the way that those assets are being deployed. Um, but as we think about this, we, we kind of get back to it really being led by investors, of which then we kind of address it with the issuance. And, and when we think about just some principles, we, we kind of have found, uh, you know, six principles around responsible investing that were kind of introduced in kind of the, the mid 2000s. And, and, and just kind of reading those very quickly, um, you know, it's talking about uh, incorporating ESG issues into investment analysis and decision making processes. I think that actually, you know, is fairly straightforward. Um, looking to be active owners and incorporate ESG issues into ownership policies and practices, um, seek appropriate disclosure on ESG issues by entities in which we invest. And so I think that when, you, when investors demand that, that will certainly create change on the, on the issuing and structuring side. Uh, promoting acceptance and implementation of principles within the investment industry, which I think you know, kind of these forums address and sort of help promote. Uh, working together to enhance effectiveness in implementing the principles and reporting on activities. And so I think reporting on activities is really critical. Um, and so, you know, talking about starting new ESG, ESG funds, but just even if we don't go to that extent, what is the industry doing about it? And that is that in itself, that the actual reporting of it is going to force behavioral change because that's going to require 
you know, anyone that's involved in the process to be able to address that head on and squarely. And I think that that reporting is going to drive the behavior change. And it's it's not going to come from the, the start of the process. It's, it's going to come from the, the end of the process, which will then, you know, make its way up to kind of the structuring and, and the ways that, you know, clients can adapt it in terms of bringing new transactions to market. Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so we're going to move on to discuss um, around sort of what the consequences could be if the ILS and cap bond market does not improve its ESG status. So turning to you, Nico, from Plenum, how important is it for you as a fund manager to comply with ESG standards, do you feel, with your management of cap bond funds? I think you're muted, Nico. Sorry, so thank you very much, Steve. I want to rely on our experience we had during the last three years uh, linked to the ESG topic. So what I can say is more and more banks are kicking non-ESG compliant investment content out. This is real reality. So new clients like pension funds ignore more and more non-ESG compliant investments. This has increased very significantly this year, especially here in, in, in Switzerland, but Switzerland is not part of the European community. This is funny enough, but this is driven by MIFID because they have to comply with the MIFID rules because they serve European clients as well out of Switzerland. Of course, ESG investors support a certain transition period because they know exactly that it is impossible to claim ESG without any compromises. So this is pretty clear. This counts especially for the ILS and cat bond market. But we see a certain, let's say, unrest among ESG investors because they does not see any progress during the last three years. So it's transparency, so the, the collateralized structure, but we lose some words afterwards. This is also driven by the fact that asset owners itself are standing in the ESG competition. It is simple. The higher the ESG score is, the better is the attraction to get money. So it comes on the one side from the regulatory side and of the competition um, of the asset owner they, they are facing. So to make a long story short, ESG has received a tremendous momentum in the market and has created its own standards. I think it's very important to understand what is the best practice in this world that we can comply in the future with, with the uh, standards they, they are trying to set up. So ignoring this means losing a large number of institutional clients. So this is the pain when I tell you our experience, what we saw during the last two years. So let's say it as follows. This is not a sexy business model if you are not able to, to, to be ESG compliant, I guess. So this is a little bit the warning uh, to move in a certain direction. And uh, that is the main reason why we invite for this uh, discussion. Thank you, Nico. Um, so moving on to Tommy um, from Bank for Kirsch. Um, what are the requirements for you to invest in instruments like catastrophe bonds? And what do you feel the consequences could be if the ILS and cap bond market does not move in the direction of ESG? Yeah. Yeah. Firstly, I can absolutely underline um, all the things that, that uh, Nico has said because it's exactly that what we are feeling. So we are, um, as a sustainability investor, we are taking our investment since nearly 20 years in a responsible way. Um, but what we are seeing is that mainstream investor that are not intrinsically motivated for, I would say, doing their part uh, with, with their investments to, to shape the world uh, a little bit in a, in a better direction, um, so classical investors that are not intrinsically motivated are now in a really tough competition to integrate ESG factors, to integrate ESG aspects into their investments as an asset owner, but also for their clients. And uh, here uh, it comes, of course, to, to one of, of the biggest problems probably in, in the cap bond market, that there is little less transparency. That a fund manager like um, Plenum Investment, which was just the best practice example in, in, in the whole 
uh, cap fund industry, so in the cap fund fund management industry, um, are required to uh, jump over this gap of lacking transparency in, um, yeah, and give the investors the possibility to have something that helps them to be compliant with their own ESG um, yeah, policies. And to give you an idea, what are these policies? Uh, I would say in first instance, um, this is in doing no harm with your investments. So that means that uh, with the cat bonds, um, it, it shouldn't be covered any business activities or, or any, um, or any core uh, business of, of the insurance um, that at the end is not compliant with, with our ESG policies, like the coal mining industry, like weapons, like uh, oil and gas, and so on. The second part is then to have a positive impact with your cat bond investments. So um, in general, so the idea of, of, of cat bonds is something very good. And you could say that uh, probably the idea of cat bonds is sustainable because uh, in case of, of a catastrophe, um, the, the insurer has to pay, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the, 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 the client that's, uh, that have the damage uh, receive the money for rebuild uh, the, the home, uh, for example. So this is something that has a positive impact, but only in case that, um, of course, um, you, 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 you gave the, the right insurances for sustainable, uh, for sustainable projects and sustainable businesses. And the third one is probably um, the collateral structure of a cat bond that uh, I, I, I've seen in the question that we will come afterwards to it, but also the collateral structure of a cat bond is, is uh, quite interesting for an um, ESG investor like us because we are not investing in um, US treasury bonds because of the death penalty. Um, and this is also something that of course caused a little bit of confusion in, in the cat bond structure. Um, and what would be the consequences? I think that um, coming to more and more regulation uh, in the EU, cat bonds um, as an asset class will be in trouble um, to, to be investable for ESG compliant investors and more and more becoming also uh, difficult uh, for mainstream investors. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tommy. Um, so moving on to discuss um, sort of where, where would we begin to improve cap bond structures? What are the, the factors that need to be enhanced in order to get a better ESG recognition? Um, and also how long is the transition period to fulfill these type of requirements. So turning to Dirk, um, what do you see as critical topics here and how can we improve the ESG standing of catastrophe bonds and perhaps other ILS? Yeah, I think we already heard from Tommy a little bit where the pain for investors is. From a portfolio manager perspective, that's of course a little bit the flip side of the coin. So we get questions asked by, for example, a bank vacation Caritas, what is your exposure to this industry or to that industry? And um, for us, the, the, one of the critical issues that we always face is how can we answer these, these questions? How can we report on these? And especially um, not every ESG investor is the same. So there are different questions coming from, uh, I think Corey, Corey also mentioned this, um, if you speak to global investors or investors coming with different backgrounds, and they have different targets, what they want to know from us as portfolio managers. And I think it's fair for investors to ask these questions, but sometimes it's very, very difficult for ILS funds to answer these questions, especially when it comes to uh, what, are, what type of industries are you exposed? Um, in some cases, we only have to guess, especially when you have questions like, yes, are you exposed to tabac tobacco industry or so? Um, as soon as you cover some kind of agricultural exposure, uh, it could be in there, but we don't know for certain. So reporting with everything, all these reporting duties become very, very difficult for ILS investors. And I think 
Um, that's also one of the reasons why we wanted to have this round table um, to make all people involved in the value chain and the creation of capital so aware that there's a lot of probably reporting duties coming to ILS investors, especially from a regulatory perspective, but also from simply client needs um, on what risk, what type of risk do you really insure? And of course, we as, or as a portfolio manager, I don't want to be limited to an extremely small portion of the market just to be compliant, um, simply because I don't know what the rest might contain or might not contain. I think that's one of the, um, the topics that we very often deal with. Um, another topic is, uh, and that was mentioned a few times today, the collateral structure. Uh, I think uh, Tommy Piemont has clearly laid out where, what the problem there is. Yes, we see that the market is improving. Um, on the other hand, I also see a limited danger of having just one uniform collateral solution uh, in, a, in a way diversification is also good um, from, a, from a portfolio manager perspective. But yeah, we should maybe put our heads together and think whether there are other safe solutions um, that satisfy the needs of the CDIN, satisfy the needs of the ILS investor and our, our compliance and CSG standards and reporting questions. Great, thank you, Dirk. Um, so moving over to Corey, um, the transparency issue on sort of the underlying books of insurance and reinsurance, uh, obviously one of the key issues here, um, particularly for investors who are very, very focused on ESG compliance. Um, so that requirement for more transparency, do you think that pre presents a problem? for cedents, for the market as a whole? Is that, because to me, that doesn't seem like anything is gonna happen there particularly quickly, but it probably does need to. I think some of the cedents are already facing these questions directly when they're dealing with their direct financing uh, efforts uh, or are trying to be proactive on it. So for instance, Generali's Green Bond coming out and, and talking about, I'm going to get sources of funding and be responsible with how I utilize that capital to support my risk transfer business. Um, so I, I think there's some ways that, that some of that information is coming up. I think also a lot of the um, security laws requirements are in, require mandating that there's enhanced reporting on this and that creates uh, increased transparency. I think the question that I have more fundamental for ILS in how you apply ESG is what your objectives are out of an ESG investment. Is it to indirectly uh, bolster what you're doing on the traditional financing, which is to go after sectors that you feel that are contributing to the climate risk? Um, because if you were to look at the direct correlation, certainly climate risk doesn't cause increased property losses at energy companies. However, what you're trying to do is by constraining access to capital, which insurance and reinsurance is a form of that, uh, by not by saying you're not going to aid that company in using um, uh, legacy, you know, whether it's energy mechanisms or, or you know, other sectors has have other reasons in order to to force the change, then that's that's one thing with with ESG. But another way to go is whether ESG is going to focus on climate risk outright in the insurance and the reinsurance space and how these structures can tackle it. Um, you know, I think that really what needs to be found from an ESG framework is what are the parameters that predict the future? Um, we tend to take, frankly, in all sectors, but in, in this space, we tend to look at um, uh, past development through the, the lens of current parameters as opposed to predicting what's going to happen forward. And obviously, if we can increase that predictive power, it, it betters the risk versus return aspect and hopefully contributes to um, uh, affecting the climate risk. But I really think it, it's a question of where does the end source ESG money want to apply itself to tackling these sources? Because it's a variety of ways that could go. Um, and I would say in almost every structure that we deal with today, we already have investors asking the questions, more the more classical ESG questions. So, you know, uh, does the sponsor support these different types of of sectors, whether it's weapons, whether it's oil, whether it's, you know, it's just a wide range of stuff. And I guess the question is, is that how can we move this forward so that we can meaningfully enhance ESG money that would help promote further development in this space? Um, you know, I think the World Bank's efforts have been tremendous. Um, 
uh, and it's not just from the collateral that we use, also EBRD, which we which we use, but it's the fact of what the World Bank does in trying to um, promote sustainable development by trying to eliminate climate risk from causing the volatility that affects governmental budgets uh, for those that um, may be on more of a financial tightrope. Um, and so we've seen efforts around how they've promoted, whether it was a pandemic deal, whether it was uh, government of Philippines getting protection from typhoon and earthquake to Mexico, et cetera. You know, there's been a, uh, a large um, effort by their side to um, promote a management of climate risk and the impact of it, along with um, socially responsible investing. Great, thank you, Corey. Um, so turning to Paul um, from Aon, on the sort of uh, the transparency question, um, how, how does the industry balance the need for additional transparency so that people can be more certain of the ESG characteristics of an investment versus confidentiality when it comes to seedance information? And I guess also in that is um, when you move further down the chain into retrocession, obviously the the details of what lie beneath become even less clear usually? Yeah, so it's a great question. I would say, you know, first of all, one of the founding principles for ILS is that it, it, it is a transparent asset class. And so I think transparency has always been embedded into cap bonds, um, something the uh, you know, industry, I think, you know, all participants have been proud of. And so, you know, transparency as a, as a founding principle is something where I think that is you know, a, a key kind of investment uh, thesis, you know, for, for why these deals get done. And so looking to expand that around ESG is it's just a natural sort of development of, of where we are. Um, now to be able to do so, I think, you know, you have to articulate sort of the, the benefits of it. And so first, first of all, like most, would, most of us would say it's the right thing to do. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, helpful in itself. But as you know, as CDENs kind of weigh the disclosure that's associated with this, um, you know, the transparency around what is in their insurance book or reinsurance book, um, you know, I think they're going to want to understand kind of what's what's the trade-off here, you know, what, what does disclosure bring? And I think, you know, having a view on the growth potential that can come from kind of a more ESG compliant strategy is really what the industry needs to articulate. So, uh, it's one thing to say, you know, making this transparency for the, you know, because it's the right thing to do, we're going to trade tomorrow the same way we traded yesterday. That's a little bit of a harder discussion. But to say, here's kind of where, you know, again, the theme of the right thing to do, kind of where regulation is going, kind of just the, what has to happen. And, you know, with an ESG compliant strategy, you know, that can lead to uh, more growth. Uh, more availability of this product, the ability to do things differently. I think that's a very set of, very different set of discussions. And so I think, as, as always, everything is a, is a balancing act. But fundamentally, I think the industry has been, been founded on a theme of transparency. And so to, to take this, uh, to, you know, to ratchet this up around ESG, I think it's just, it's just sort of natural. Yeah, that's a great point as well, Paul. Thank you. Um, so moving to Andy from Swiss Re, um, there's obviously, Tommy mentioned um, the, the problems with investing in treasuries for some investors, um, US treasuries and money market funds. Do you see any solutions coming down the pipeline? Do you have any other thoughts about what the industry can do to broaden out the range of ESG compliant or qualifying collateral solutions? Yeah, it's 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 a really good question and one that um, I guess we've been wrestling on our side and I'm sure, you know, it sounds like the rest of the market is also thinking about this too. Um, and, and, you know, in, in the ESG context, there is a, a wider debate about the evaluation of sovereign debt issuers. Um, but of course, it's in respect of the US, it becomes an issue for the ILS market because of the heavy usage of um, US money market funds for the, the collateral solutions. Um, now, clearly, the reason why that is the case is obviously, you know, the US government bond market being the largest and, you know, perceived to be the safest in the world and the money market fund structure providing the liquidity to make post event payments. So that we're sort of constrained a little bit by 
that context for why we look for the you know the safe haven for for the assets and trying to um, have the uh, the least correlation to financial markets risks. So in that context, um, it's somewhat tricky, but I suppose you you do have to think about it from um, that strength and liquidity providing a sustainable environment to support reinsurers with their claims payment obligations to policyholders. So there are some societal benefits in doing that on the flip side. And this you know, comes back to that there are shades of gray here uh, as well when, when you think about the end-to-end -end benefits of, you know, and, and yes. Um, but as I say, it's, it is an issue beyond our market. I mean, the US debt makes up over 30% of the FTSE World Government Bond Index. So it is an issue for most fixing up income investors, even if it's, you know, even more acute in our market. Um, and as, as Tommy alluded to, um, many investors say that the US fails to meet sort of certain ESG standards. Um, I think Tommy alluded to the death penalty. Um, I think it's a large, you know, it is a large arms manufacturer, one of the largest polluters, withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement, social inequality. I mean, there's a list of, accusations you know that, that can be put there um which you know over time will change obviously it's politically driven as well um if, we, if we're thinking about the us that might change in you know with the with the new administration um but and and there's been a, you know alluding to movements through the regulatory agencies too so the sec for example has signaled that standardized climate disclosure mandates can replace the current voluntary disclosure regime. So th things like this sort of coming back to that transparency, it, it looks like it's going to be a sort of regulatory mandate in the not too distant future as well. Um, but if we come, I mean, if we come back to the ILS market and the solution on the, the collateral side, um, and to the extent that we want to see obviously that choice, we've talked about other solutions being available today. So IBRD and EBRD notes, for example, um, you know, similar to, to Swiss Re's actually own most recent cat bond transaction, um, the Matterhorn 2025 uh, notes. Um, those, those used EBRD notes as, a, as, as the collateral precisely for sustainability reasons. So that was the, the purpose behind the switch. Um, and I suppose in there, we can possibly see incremental enhancement for, you know, other development banks that, that have been sort of showing interest in coming into the space, um, potentially other well-rated governments or institutions to offer collateral for such structures that can provide the necessary security and liquidity, but with a bit more of an ESG focus in mind. Um, but this takes time. I mean, it took time originally for those two development banks to come into the market, you know, and they've got the size and the rating and the scale and liquidity um, to support. And it will take time, you know, for, for others to come in. But it, it's it's easy to think about the future, um, you know, this, this source of financing as potentially being interesting to, to other issuers as well. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, so I'm aware of time now. So I'm going to skip forward slightly to um, talk about the sustainable development goals um, and where the contribution of the insurance industry is currently quite limited, um, but impact investing is potentially going to become a significant differentiation factor for ESG focused investors anyway. So how can we solve this problem? Dirk from Plenum, a question for you. Um, there have been some discussions around the implementation of so-called insurance sustainable development goals or ISDGs. Um, what's your opinion about this approach and um, what, what do you know of them so far? Yeah, we've been, thank you probably for that question. We're very, uh, I would say, a little bit remote from all that development. I mean, it's predominantly driven by large insurance and, and insurance companies, Swiss Re being one of them. Um, but I think it's, it's actually a great debate that we're having here because when, especially Nico and I sat together and, and discussed um, has the cap on market impact or insurance and securities? I mean, it is absolutely clear to me that insurance and reinsurance is extremely beneficial to our society and helps to stabilize societies um, after post-event uh, by rebuilding. So there's a, a huge positive contribution of that asset class uh, of in, or insurance and reinsurance in general. Um, but when you carefully look at the SDGs, and for some time it looked like impact investment means following some kind of these SDGs. 
we quickly realize that if you're true to the word, what you want to achieve or, or how these SDGs are formulated, insurance doesn't really fit in there. And so I think it's a great initiative to really bridge that gap, to give insurance the role and the perspective that it should have, because I think it's, uh, it's pretty much overlooked at that, at that point in time. And we are all very often having this discussion that in a way, it, it also helps development. Um, and I think the World Bank is, is one great example. I mean, if you help develop an insurance market, you also help, uh, let's say, to attract other investments uh, because in act, you can actually insure infrastructure as society will come back on their feet after a post event uh, much quicker. Uh, so I think it's, it's a very positive development and we, we highly appreciate it. And of course, we, we will carefully look at it and see whether this can also be applied to capital, capital markets and how ILS funds are managed. Great, thank you, Dirk. Um, so turning to Roland, um, would you support a method such as an extension of SDGs to incorporate insurance risk products within it? And um, how do you think that would help to keep ILS and cap bonds more relevant in the ESG context? Perhaps before giving this answer, coming back to, to Paul's statement about transparency, and um, you're a bit in a bad position as you are proposing something within the insurance industry, but only linked to cat bonds, where perhaps I got the message wrong, but I don't agree at all on the transparency part. To give you an example, when we had the case by Plenum contacting us to see where the money finally goes to. First of all, sustainability, the, the basis is transparency. You have to know where the money finally goes to. Is there a cost of capital in secondary market effect so that you can justify a best in class approach investing in top 10 market cap companies because you either increase an ESG score or you in or decrease capital cost if it's worst or best in class. Without having any transparency, you cannot do anything. And then regulation won't take consideration of cat bonds when you're not able to say, finally, it's the same for CLOs. Um, each contract um, has to be assured, as what Tommy said, that at least no harm will be created. Because I could have told you a lot more about taxonomy. One main pillar of, of taxonomy is do no significant harm. When you're not able to dig into, and it's nasty work, any detailed um, insurance contract behind, you will not make it to the EU regulation. It's my prediction. Because when you say it's a guess or an estimation, don't know if your regulation fits in. So, and it has been, and we, we did best practice with Plenum to at least try to figure out from, from an inductive point of view that no harming activities will be done. I think we did the great work. It was a huge work, but it's not that the CDENs had been willing to disclose their individual contracts behind. Perhaps I, I misunderstood what you meant with, with transparency, but our experience was that there's a huge lack of the willingness of, of being open. Of course, there's some, some issues like the banking industry. You have the, the banking secrecy, like what you have, the, the, the secrecy not disclosing um, um, the ones behind. But I think this has to be a, a trade-off. And, and of course, um, it's a bit old-fashioned of not investing something we dislike, but Tommy also pointed out it's a bit the, 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 the 1.0 SOI style. It's more about positive criteria. And of course, when you link um, the ingredients of a cat bond to a concrete SDG number, be it poverty when there is a, 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 a hunger crisis after some catastrophes, um, um, what the World Bank did already, uh, I think then you will have open doors and being on a perhaps new field when you involve all the, 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 the stakeholders within, a, within this kind of new Ketman structure, then perhaps the willingness of being transparent, transparent from the beginning will be much higher. So to link any contract that fits into this catastrophe bond link to an SDG will then enable a proof of use of proceeds because it's all about use of proceeds and where the money goes to. And of course, this will be much, much more positively seen than what I heard about regulation that, that anyway, banks and insurance probably won't make it within this green economic activity stuff. So will be rather seen as neutral. 
don't know if it has been rather clear or, or too confusing, but that I want to make a point on transparency, which from our point of, of, of case is, is lacking. Um, why you need other methodologies to prove kind of ESG compliance with the existing cat structures, looking into the future for all these SDGs, when you try to make this link to a concrete SDGs and to have the particular contracts that you can prove if money flows, it goes into these and these positively linked uh, um, 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 fields. I think then it would be very, very able even be an article nine product because you have this use of proceeds character. So it's a, it's a deep green product, what, what people say to your article nine products. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roland. I guess I'll um, just flip that back to Paul, see if you have a response to that at all. Yeah, I, I think Roland's mixing apples and oranges together a little bit in the discussion. So I think the, the comments around transparency have been that uh, I think ILS has been transparent from day one in terms of the risk, where the risk comes from, the nature of the risk, the characteristics of the risk, how the risk is modeled. And so that, that was the point. I think I, I also acknowledge that if we're going to go down a more transparent route around ESG, so ESG compliance, then I think we have to be able to articulate to, to the cedents the benefit of, of doing so. So I think the cedents have already taken the approach that they are going to disclose the risk characteristics of their book in good detail to allow uh, the ILS funds and any other type of investor to make an investment decision about investing in the risk. I think that what I'd rather do is change it from a negative to a positive, where let's articulate the positives for students disclosing more of an ESG uh, compliant methodology. And so, you know, what are the benefits in doing so for the students? Because if the benefits are they can trade tomorrow like they traded yesterday, I'm not sure that's an articulated benefit that's worth a lot. So if the benefit is either there's going to be you know, growth capital, because when you, when you think about the paradigm shift that's happening in the market around ESG, and you think about all of the comments about where the fund growth and where the investment dollars, you know, as articulated by this panel are going to go in the future, there is a huge benefit that you can articulate around having an ESG compliant investment and fund strategy and being, and then taking that and, and then making it very real for the seedants that are seeding risk into cap funds, as an example, I, I think is very achievable. It's a lot of work, but I think it is very achievable. And if you can make that articulation and you can articulate the value around doing so, my, my guess is because it's not only the right thing to do, but because there is a benefit associated with it, you're going to see more transparency around ESG. So I think the apples and oranges is that, you know, the industry itself is very transparent around the risk profile. I think the orange piece of it that Roland was highlighting is that around ESG, there can be more that can be done in the future. And my, my direction around that is, I think students will adopt that and embrace it, but they need to see the benefits. So rather than making it a negative conversation, make it a positive conversation about why, you know, why they should do that. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so I guess I'll turn maybe to Tommy and um, see if you have a view on sort of what you would like to see from the ILS and cap bond market in terms of transparency to help you be confident in investing. Yeah, so um, as, as it was mentioned also by, by Roland, for us at the end, as an investor, um, we would like to see that our money that is invested and at the end is invested into the cap bonds um, is used to raise this kind of businesses or to give insurance to the businesses that we consider as sustainable or at least at not doing harm for, for our common future. Um, this is probably one of, 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 the, main, of the main tasks of the, of the industry to, to ensure that. And the second one, not to, not to say only the same things like, like the other panelists uh, already said, I would like to, to, to give also one, one more idea that, that we would like to see as, as an investor of cat bond funds, so of, or, or ILS uh, funds. Um, so for us, this positive impact, of course, 
um, is, is done if the, if the insurance uh, behind the, the cap bonds uh, is going um, into sustainable businesses or sustainable core businesses, the, the insurance book. Um, you can say, but of course we would all, all also see that more and more um, um, insurances and cap bonds um, are, are given to emerging markets. So, um, so the, the the World Bank uh, cap bond for, for the Philippines is, is probably one of these examples that that we would like to see. Uh, to, to come more, um, to, to have this positive impact. Um, also, pandemic emergency facilities uh, is something that, that we really would like to, to see more um, to, to be investable. And of course, also uh, insurance risks for, for example, wind farms or wind failure, um, um, something like that, that we, we can align more and more to this really positive impact to, to give more um, and more money to, to businesses um, or to areas where the money is really need to build up um, the, the a sustainable future and then of course to meet the, the SDGs. Great, thank you, Tommy. Um, so we are literally two minutes away from time, but I thought I'd just try and bring Patrick back into the conversation because I'm aware I've left you out of it for a bit, bit too much there. Um, have you got a, a couple of minutes of just summary for us having listened to the conversation and from what you've learned from the survey? Oh, I, I would say, I guess, you know, constant dripping wears away the stone. So, you know, we should, not stop. I mean, you should keep. You should keep asking the questions, so that you get the transparency from the students. Because I would say, from the discussions I have with with our clients, and that's now a bit outside the survey, transparency is is an issue. So the, the ones that want to get a clear view on the, the ESG profile of, of an investment, they, they currently do not have all information at hand that they need to have. But uh, I guess. Uh, I don't know whether it was Andy, but Swiss Re did. I heard a good job on the Motorhorn deal in respect of ESG disclosure. So I, I mean, the market the market is moving in, in the right direction, uh, but it will need time, and I guess the regulation will help to build up some pressure at least here uh, here in Europe. Great, thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I think that that's also key that um, the market is moving in the right direction. There's certainly a lot of goodwill behind the ESG initiatives in, in ILS. So hopefully we can meet the, uh, the demands of investors like Tommy in future anyway. Um, so that is our hour. Um, I don't want to run over because I'm not, I'm sure you've all got meetings to rush off to. Um, so thank you all for participating. I really appreciate it. Um, so